Hey everybody, this is Gregory from DAP University, and today we're going to be talking about smart contracts. This will be the first video in a mini-series where we'll be talking about smart contracts. Today we'll be going over the conceptual overview of what a smart contract is, and next week we'll dive into the code of a smart contract. So be sure to subscribe to the channel so that you can be notified about that second video when it comes out. So what is a smart contract? Well, a smart contract is a digital representation of a real world contract. And smart contracts are the building blocks of dApps or decentralized applications that run on the blockchain. So let's unpack that a little bit. And let's set the stage to see what a smart contract is and how they work and why they're useful. Let's look at the internet as it exists today. You could call the internet today the internet of information. That's because this is where we send data or information back and forth between our devices that are connected to servers. This information could be emails, it could be status updates on a social network, or it could even be payments that we make when we log into our bank account and pay a bill. The current internet of information as we know it is centralized because all of the sending and receiving and doing stuff with the data is handled by a central server or a group of servers. And these are controlled by single entities, usually organizations or businesses. Because the current internet of information is centralized, it's really bad at representing value. And that's because of how the infrastructure works. Data in the databases on the central servers could change at any time. Code that governs how our application works, this code lives on a central server and can be changed at any time by developers and is at risk of being hacked and changed. For example, it's really hard to create a currency or money in this centralized way because the data could change. The total amount of money could change, which would mean it's not scarce anymore, and that would lower the value of each token. And the amount of money that I hold could change at any time. It could be modified, it could be duplicated, or it could be deleted entirely. Blockchain tries to solve this problem and create the internet of value. Now see, blockchain is different from a centralized web structure that we know today. It's decentralized. All the data and the code in the blockchain is distributed and secured by every device connected to the network. We don't have the vulnerabilities of a central server anymore. And all of the data is guaranteed to be unique and unchangeable and unhackable. This makes the blockchain a great implementation for representing value because it's able to re represent something that's unchangeable, unique, and unhackable. That's why currency was the first major use case for blockchain technology. So let's take a quick look at Bitcoin, the first major blockchain that deals with currency. So Bitcoin allows us to know that each token we hold is unique. We can't duplicate it. We know that it belongs to us and that the total of number of the tokens can't change. And it allows us to send tokens in a reliable way from one person to another without fear of hacking or that these other properties will change. That's how Bitcoin implements an internet of value. Now more mature blockchains like Ethereum extend this idea of the internet of value by allowing us to do more on the blockchain than just send currency back and forth. See, Ethereum allows us to write other types of data to transactions on the blockchain besides just who sent money to whom. Ethereum allows us to model ownership and track value of things besides just currency tokens. For example, I could have a digital representation of the deed to my house and I could sell it to you on the blockchain. Once you buy it, the deed would be transferred to you and you would then legally own the house. 
the ownership of this title can be tracked just like currency movements because we can guarantee that it's unique, that it will only belong to one person at a time, and the blockchain ledger backs all this up. And we can track this kind of transfer of value with an advanced blockchain like Ethereum. Now this is an example of how Ethereum would allow us to track something with clear monetary value, but it will also allow us to model and track things that don't have clear monetary value, but that we want to guarantee are unique and won't be manipulated. An example might be a vote in an election. For example, we could hold an election on the blockchain so that we know that each vote will be counted, that it will only be counted once, and that the candidate with the correct number of votes would actually win the election. And I actually have a video tutorial on how you can build a decentralized Ethereum voting application, and I'll link to that in this video. So how does a mature blockchain like Ethereum allow us to create the internet of value? How does it allow us to track things besides just cryptocurrency? Well, that's where smart contracts come into play. See, smart contracts are the building blocks of decentralized applications that allow us to model value for things besides just currency. And it allows us to write programs that store, transfer, and do stuff with all that value. They're called smart contracts because they're digital representations of real-world contracts. They represent some kind of covenant or agreement where value is exchanged based upon some set of predetermined rules or conditions. In the case of an election, like I mentioned before, it would be a contract that a vote is counted, that it's only counted once, and that the candidate with the most votes will actually win. And in the case of selling you the deed to my house, it would be a contract that the house is for sale, and that if you have enough money, then the deed will legally be transferred to you, and that the deed is unique, and that no one else will hold the deed. In order to get a conceptual glimpse of how the smart contracts work, let's first look at a simple transferring of value between accounts like with Bitcoin or Ethereum, just where I'm going to send you cryptocurrency from my account to yours. If I were to do this, we would both need accounts connected to the network, and each of our accounts would have an address. And I would send money from my account to your address, and when I do this, my account would go down by, let's say, 5 Bitcoin or Ethereum, and yours would go up by 5 Bitcoin or Ethereum. Now the blockchain keeps track of this currency movement on the ledger, and it doesn't really require a central intermediary to complete this transaction. It's decentralized. The blockchain will take care of all of it for us. Now this is a simple transaction. What about a more advanced transaction? What if I want to sell you my house? I would need a place to store the deed to my house and I would need a way for someone to buy it and to transfer it. That's what a smart contract does. This is where we would write the program that would accept our deed and it would allow someone to purchase it. And whenever they purchase it, it would transfer the deed from the smart contract to that person's account. And it would release all the funds once the deed is sold to my account. Now, what about the code of a smart contract? Let's look at some pseudocode of what a simple value transfer might look like with something like Bitcoin, like where I'm just sending cryptocurrency from my account to yours. This is the kind of simple program that would get executed for each Bitcoin transaction on the network. And it does exactly what a currency transaction should do. It simply takes in value and it transfers it from one account to another, provided that there is enough value in the sender's account. The transaction features many attributes of a normal programming language, like functions, variables, if statements, etc. But what if we were going to do something like sell a house? Then we would need a much more robust programming language something with complex data structures, loops, variables, etc., etc. That's what we get 
with smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain. The smart contracts in Ethereum are written in Solidity, which is a language that looks a lot like JavaScript. And it's a full-blown programming language with all these features that we would need to digitally model real-world contracts, to do something like sell the deed to a house. It would allow us to model ownership, to transfer value, and to handle advanced transactions that would read and write to the blockchain. Now, Solidity is a contract-oriented language, which means that contracts are the fundamental building blocks that we use to build decentralized applications. And this is somewhat related to classes or objects in an object-oriented language. The smart contracts are what allow us to encapsulate data and behavior in our decentralized applications. They also support inheritance and they can talk to one another, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we've seen how smart contracts allow us to create an internet of value. Let's take a look at some other use cases for smart contracts to give us an idea of what they can do and how they work. The first example I want to look at is crowdfunding. A Kickstarter is probably the most famous centralized example of a crowdfunding platform. You know, it's a platform where people try to fund the creation of their product by allowing supporters to pledge money towards the product. It's effectively pre-selling the product. And in many cases, these backers get other bonus rewards besides the product itself. Now with Kickstarter, people pledge money to the campaign. If it's funded, their funds are paid out to the product creators. If the product isn't funded, then the money goes back to the pledgers. Now because Kickstarter is a centralized platform, Kickstarter gets a cut for managing all the money. We could do this with a smart contract instead where the creators of the product will be able to keep more money. Let's see how that would work. If we were going to build a smart contract to take care of all of this, we would need some supporters who were connected to the network. And each of them would possess some Ethereum with a wallet address. And when they pledge money to fund the product, they pay into the smart contract. And when they do, they simultaneously pay a small fee for doing so. That's because all the transactions on the Ethereum blockchain cost gas. Now, when they pledge money during the funding phase, their pledge money is stored in the smart contract. And it's important to know that the smart contract can store value. It's just like a user account in this way. It has an address, just like a user account. If the project is funded before the time limit, then the money is released to the project creator. And if not, it goes back to the pledgers. Now, the smart contract is in charge of keeping track of the pledge goal, the time limit. It's in charge of governing all the rules of this pledge campaign. It's a contract that the pledgers will get the product that they paid for if the goal is met and that they'll be refunded if it isn't. And it's also a contract that the creator will get their money based upon the same conditions or not. Now, why would we build a crowdfunding campaign with a smart contract instead of the normal centralized model? Well, there are a few reasons, but the biggest one is this. Remember that I said that Kickstarter would take a fee for all successfully funded projects. Well, what if that fee was 10%? And what if we were trying to raise a million dollars? Well, that would be $100,000. And if we did this with a smart contract instead, the creators of the product would be able to keep that $100,000. The next big use case that I want to examine are what I call event-based payouts. A smart contracts could collect data about real-world events and issue payouts to users based on the outcome of those events. So basically, a smart contract could collect data about stock prices, sports scores, weather conditions, etc., etc., and it could be in charge of managing a set of conditions around that data. 
If the conditions are met, then some people could get payouts, and if not, well, then they wouldn't. For example, a smart contract could be in charge of collecting stock market data, like the price of stocks, and it could manage options contracts where you know people would effectively bet on the price of a stock. And if they were right, then the smart contract will pay them. And if they weren't, well, then it won't. Another example would be modeling insurance with a smart contract. Let's say that we have 10 people who pay into an insurance policy. Our smart contract could effectively be the insurance policy or contract that governs all the rules of this policy. And since our smart contract is consuming all kinds of data about real-world events, it might know when a natural disaster would happen. Let's say, like, a wildfire. And when this wildfire happens, it knows that one of our 10 people who paid into this policy is affected by the wildfire. It knows that that person lives there. This contract would be aware of the natural disaster, and it would know the coordinates of the person's house. It also might have some more advanced capabilities to verify damage on the person's house. And if all those conditions are met, then that person would get a payout from the smart contract that they paid into as their insurance policy. And this would effectively automate the entire system and remove the need for an insurance adjuster and anyone else who might be involved in this process. And the last major use case that I want to look at is the Internet of Things and how Internet of Things devices could be integrated with smart contracts. Let's say that you wanted to rent a hotel or an Airbnb for one night. And normally you would check into your hotel or your Airbnb. You'd pick up a key or you would check in through a website or a front desk or something like that. Now with a smart contract, you could automate the management of this short-term rental with Internet of Things devices. You wouldn't have to go to a front desk to pick up a key and you wouldn't have to rely upon someone to check you in. If a smart contract was aware of Internet of Things devices, then a smart contract could be in charge of unlocking our doors with a smart lock and dispensing some kind of key or keypad code that we would receive once we check into our rental. It could also be in charge of turning on our lights or our water or even enabling or disabling Wi-Fi access. And it could also trigger an alarm if we, the tenant, haven't vacated the short-term rental by the time that we said we would when we paid into the smart contract. So that concludes part one of our mini-series on smart contracts, where we've looked at the conceptual overview of what a smart contract is and what it does. And next week, I'll be diving into the code of a smart contract. So be sure to subscribe to the channel so that you can be notified about that video when it comes out. And until then, thanks for watching DAP University.